أعوذ بالله السميع العليم من الشيطان الرجيم من همزه ونفخه ونفخه بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على رسولنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه ومن وراء السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته Our checking questions for today are How are you? How is your week? What are some things that come to your mind when you're alone and reflecting about life? How do you navigate any fluctuations of self-worth? Self-worth meaning how you feel about yourself, or you know anything that how you value yourself. <clears throat> If you feel down, what are some things that make you feel this way? So a person reaches out to you and mentions she is not happy. She's been trying to find happiness, purpose, and meaning, but is constantly finding herself questioning her worth. Is she a burden on everyone? And that it would be better for her not to be alive? If you ever have these thoughts, there are hotlines that you can reach out to, suicide hotlines, and you can have a conversation with them. And there might be some community resources for people around uh, that you should definitely go ahead and uh, seek. In this case, sometimes people do feel alone, um, but many people feel this way. So, talking about it is definitely something that is a benefit, inshallah. So, this person is questioning herself. She's questioning her worth. She's considering herself a burden on everyone. And is it better for her not to be alive? Uh, she feels sad and lonely every day. This hurts her a lot. And when she struggles to find happiness and purpose, she sees others who seem to be happy and have the things uh, she would like to have. Should be things. Uh, things she would like to have. She would have liked to have. How would you approach the situation? And what are some potential causes and solutions that your strategy will be based on or will take into account? So think about this. As you think about this, let us review a little bit. This is the process of transformation. It does take time. It's not something that happened necessarily overnight. And the idea is to maintain your transformation or to sustain it as in continue forward, but at a rate that you could sustain not too much and not too little. There are very common things that usually overwhelm us. And they're so common, so frequent, that so many people feel them. Uh, however, many of us may not realize how common they are. For example, something that doesn't have meaning, something that is unrealistic, like when you don't have purpose behind something. All of these things are actually very common among many people. Many people are struggling with these things. However, the people that struggle Most of them might feel that they are alone in this struggle. But in reality, the person next door, the person next to them might be feeling the exact same thing for the exact same reasons. And just having that conversation can really, really help provide some sort of support, some sort of understanding and connection. With that, on to our brain games. So pick one. All right, one. Well, we all need a reason to wake up. For me, it just took 11,000 volts. 
what are you too polite to ask, so I will tell you. When I, sophomore year of college, just back from Thanksgiving holiday, a few of my friends and I were horsing around, and we decided to climb atop a parked commuter train. It's just sitting there with the wires that run overhead. Somehow that seemed like a great idea at the time. We'd certainly done stupider things. Um, I scurried up the ladder on the back, and when I stood up, the electrical current entered my arm, blew down and out my feet, and that was that. Would you believe that watch still works? <laughs> Takes a licking. My father wears it now in solidarity. That night began my formal relationship with death. Uh, my death. And it also began my long run as a patient. It's a good word. It means one who suffers. So I guess we're all patients. Now, the American healthcare system has more than its fair share of dysfunction to match its brilliance, to be sure. Uh, I'm a physician now, a hospice and palliative medicine doc, so I've seen care from both sides. And believe me, most everyone who goes into healthcare really means well. I mean, truly. But we who work in it are also unwitting agents for a system that too often does not serve. Why? Well, there's actually a pretty easy answer to that question. It explains a lot. Because healthcare was designed with diseases, not people at its center. Which is to say, of course, it was badly designed. And nowhere are the effects of bad design more heartbreaking or the opportunity for good design more compelling than at the end of life, where things are so distilled and concentrated. No do-overs. My purpose today is to reach out uh, across disciplines and invite design thinking into this big conversation. That is, to bring intention and creativity to the experience of dying. We have a monumental opportunity in front of us before a universal, one of the few universal issues as individuals as well as a civil society to rethink and redesign how it is we die. So let's begin at the end. For most people, the scariest thing about death isn't being dead. It's dying, suffering, the key distinction. And to get underneath this, it can be very helpful to tease out suffering, which is necessary, as it is, uh, from suffering we can change. The former is a natural, essential part of life, part of the deal. And to this, we are called to make space, adjust, grow. It can be really good to realize forces larger than ourselves. They bring proportionality, like a cosmic right-sizing. After my limbs were gone, that loss, for example, became fact, fixed, necessarily part of my life. And I learned I could no more reject uh, this fact than reject myself. It took me a while, but I'd learned it eventually. Now, another great thing about necessary suffering is that it is the very thing that uh, unites caregiver and care receiver, uh, human beings. This, we are finally realizing, is where healing happens. Yes, compassion, literally, as we learned yesterday, suffering together. Now, on the systems side, on the other hand, so much of the suffering is unnecessary, invented, serves no good purpose. But the good news is, since this brand of suffering is made up, well, we can change it. How we die is indeed something we can affect. Now, making the system sensitive to this fundamental distinction between necessary and unnecessary suffering gives us our first of three 
design cues for the day. After all, our role as caregivers, as people who care, is to relieve suffering, not add to the pile. True to the tenets of palliative care, I function as something of a reflective advocate as much as a prescribing physician. Uh, quick aside, palliative care, very important field, but poorly understood. Uh, while it includes, it is not limited to end of life care. It is not limited to hospice. It's simply about comfort and living well at any stage. Okay, so please know that you don't have to be dying anytime soon to benefit from palliative care. Now, let me introduce you to Frank. Uh, sort of makes this point. I've been seeing Frank now for years. He's living with advancing prostate cancer on top of longstanding HIV. We work on his bone pain and his fatigue, but most of the time we spend thinking out loud together about his life, really about our lives. In this way, Frank grieves. In this way, he keeps up with his losses as they roll in so that he's ready to take in the next moment. The loss is one thing, but regret quite another. So Frank has always been an adventurer. Looks like something out of a Norman Rockwell painting and no fan of regret. So it wasn't surprising when he came into clinic one day saying he wanted to raft down the Colorado River. Was this a good idea? You know, with all the risks to his safety and his health, some would say no, many did, but he went for it while he still could. And it was a glorious, marvelous trip. Freezing water, blistering dry heat, scorpion snakes, wildlife howling off of the flaming walls of the Grand Canyon. All the glorious side of the world beyond our control. Now Frank's decision, while maybe dramatic, is exactly the kind so many of us would make if we only had the support to figure out what is best for ourselves over time. So much of what we're talking about today is a shift in perspective. After my accident, when I went back to college, I uh, changed my major to art history. Studying uh, visual art, I figured I'd learn something about how to see. A really potent lesson for a kid who couldn't change so much of what he was seeing. Perspective, that kind of alchemy we humans get to play with, turning anguish into a flower. Flash forward, now I work at a, an amazing place in San Francisco called the Zen Hospice Project, where we have a little ritual that helps with this shift in perspective. When one of our residents dies, the mortuary men come, and as we're wheeling the body out through the garden, heading for the gate, we pause. Anyone who wants, fellow residents, family, nurses, volunteers, the hearse drivers too now, to share a story or a song or silence as we sprinkle the body with flower petals. It takes a few minutes. It's a sweet, simple parting image to usher in grief with warmth rather than repugnance. Contrast that with the typical experience in the hospital setting. Much like this floodlit room lined with tubes and beeping machines and blinking lights that don't stop even when the patient's life has. Cleaning crew swoops in, the body's whisked away. It's all, it feels as though that person had never really existed. Well intended, of course, in the name of sterility, but hospitals tend to assault our senses. And the most we might hope for within those walls is numbness, anesthetic, literally the opposite of aesthetic. I revere hospitals for what they can do. I am alive because of them. But we ask too much of our hospitals. They are places for acute trauma and treatable illness. They're no place to live and die. That's not what they were designed for. Now, mind you, I'm not giving up on the notion that our institutions can become more humane. Beauty can be found anywhere. I spent a few months in a burn unit uh, at St. Barnabas Hospital in Livingston, New Jersey, where 
I got really great care at every turn, including good palliative care for my pain. And one night, it began to snow outside. I remember, <laughs> I remember my nurses complaining about driving through it. And there was no window in my room, but it was great to just imagine it coming down all sticky. Next day, one of my nurses smuggled in a snowball for me. She brought it into the unit. I cannot tell you the rapture I felt holding that in my hand. And the coldness dripping onto my burning skin, the miracle of it all, the fascination as I watched it melt and turn into water. In that moment, just being any part of this planet in this universe mattered more to me than whether I lived or died. That little snowball packed all the inspiration I needed to both try to live and be okay if I did not. In a hospital, that's a stolen moment. In my work over the years, I've known many people who were ready to go, ready to die. And not because they had found some final peace or transcendence, but because they were so repulsed by what their lives had become. In a word, cut off or ugly. There are already record numbers of us living with chronic and terminal illness and into ever older age. And we are nowhere near ready or prepared for this silver tsunami. We need an infrastructure dynamic enough to handle these seismic shifts in our population. Now is the time to create something new, something vital. I know we can because we have to. The alternative is just unacceptable. And the key ingredients are known. Policy, education and training, systems, bricks and mortar. We have tons of input for designers of all stripes to work with. We know, for example, from research, what's most important to people who are closer to death. Comfort, feeling unburdened and unburdening to those they love. Existential peace and a sense of wonderment and spirituality. Over Zen Hospice's nearly 30 years, we've learned much more from our residents in subtle detail. Little things aren't so little. Take Jeanette. She finds it harder to breathe one day to the next due to ALS. Well, guess what? She wants to start smoking again. <laughs> and French cigarettes, if you please. Um, not out of some self-destructive bent, but to feel her lungs filled while she has them. Priorities change. Or Kate. She just wants to know her dog Austin is lying at the foot of her bed. His cold muzzle against her dry skin. Instead of more chemotherapy coursing through her veins, she's done that. Sensuous aesthetic gratification where in a moment, in an instant, we are rewarded for just being. So much of it comes down to loving our time by way of the senses, by way of the body, the very thing doing the living and the dying. Probably the most poignant room in the Zen Hospice guest house is our kitchen, which is a little strange when you realize that so many of our residents can eat very little, if anything at all. But we realize we are providing sustenance on several levels, smell, symbolic plane. Seriously, with all the heavy duty stuff happening under our roof, one of the most tried and true interventions we know of is to bake cookies. As long as we have our senses, even just one, we have at least the possibility of accessing what makes us feel human, connected. You know, imagine the ripples of this notion 
for the millions of people living and dying with dementia. Primal sensorial delights that say the things we don't have words for. Impulses that make us stay present. No need for a past or a future. So, if teasing unnecessary suffering out of the system was our first design cue, then tending to dignity by way of the senses, by way of the body, the aesthetic realm is design cue number two. Now this gets us quickly to the third and final bit for today. Namely, we need to lift our sights, to set our sights on well-being. So that life can become, and health, and health care can become about making life more wonderful rather than just less horrible. Beneficence. Here, this gets right at the distinction between a disease-centered and a patient or human-centered model of care. And here is where caring becomes a creative, generative, even playful act. Play may sound like a funny word here, but it's also one of our highest forms of adaptation. Consider every major compulsory effort it takes to be human. The need for food is birth cuisine. The need for shelters given rise to architecture, the need for cover, fashion, and for being subjected to the clock, well, we invented music. So, since dying is a necessary part of life, what might we create with this fact? By play, I am in no way suggesting that we take a light approach to dying or that we mandate any particular way of dying. There are mountains of sorrow that cannot move. And one way or another, we will all kneel there. Rather, I am asking we make space, physical, psychic room, to allow life to play itself all the way out. So that rather than just getting out of the way, Aging and dying can become a process of crescendo through to the end. We can't, we can't solve for death. <laughs> I know some of you are working on this. <laughs> <laughs> Meanwhile, we can, <laughs> we can design towards it. Now, parts of me died early on, and that's something we can all say one way or another. So I got to redesign my life around this fact, and I tell you, it has been a liberation to realize you can always find a shock of beauty or meaning in what life you have left. Like that snowball, lasting for a perfect moment, all the while melting away. If we love such moments ferociously, but then maybe we can learn to live well, not in spite of death, but because of it. Let death be what takes us, not lack of imagination. Thank you. in this one. I think it's interesting because I know in the American culture, you know, death is a very uncomfortable subject and something that people don't like to face as a general rule. Um, but I, I feel like, you know, um, Islam gives us a totally different outlook on it. And it's something that we should be thinking about constantly or every day, <laughs> preparing ourselves. It's interesting to hear somebody else's uh, perspective on it and um, yeah I mean my grandmother was in um, uh, what's it called 
at the end of life when they just care for them and keep them comfortable. I can't remember the word he used it. Uh, Pallad, was it hospice care or palliative? Oh yes, yes, hospice care. Um, so instead of being like a very, you know, cold environment, and um, it's much more welcoming, I guess. At least in our case, that's how it was. Yeah, the professor mentioned. Uh, I remember or increase or be frequent in your remembrance of the destroyer of pleasures or the, cutter, cut, the thing that cuts off pleasures. And of course, in this case, that means death. And I was just going to explain that in the, in the, the, but in, in the context of this, how can knowing that things are going to end put things in perspective so you actually appreciate the fleeting moments that you do end up living in the moment that you do, in the moments that you live them as opposed to looking for something in the here in like in the long run kind of building towards something always knowing that at any time it could be taken away there's a verse in surah yunus where allah Jalla mentions about how the example of of life uh it's like vegetation that grows and it keeps on growing until the people think that they have control over it that they are you know this is it you know they're masters over it that they that the people think that they have you know power over it until you know the the wish of the the commandment comes and everything goes away when people think that their life should be a certain way, they sort of try to build towards it. And they start sort of settling down in this world. Then, as they do that, ultimately, at any point, death comes, and that's the end of it. So, it's a nice reflection, it's a nice parable that Allah Taala gives over here about how vegetation grows and you feel like, you know, this is good, this is great, I'm going to, you know, make so much money out of this and stuff and you're really happy when you're looking at it. But then everything sort of just gets cut off because the time of death came. So this person had started to invest in something or invest in a place where the return would not be really much and then they would leave this stuff behind. Rather, another person might be looking at this and saying, well, I know I'm getting every day one, one day closer to death. So how do I keep things in perspective so that everything that I do is actually an investment in the hereafter? So I'm enjoying the moments I'm living in, but all of that is aligned to help me in the hereafter. It's an investment for the hereafter. And that puts things in perspective. And if everyone starts doing this, then there isn't this animosity and this disconnection from each other. We end up wanting to support each other because we're all doing the same thing. We're going in the same direction. But it's something to think about, something to reflect on, how to get things to be put in perspective. Why death reminds us of how to be happy, how to be content how we can use that as a positive thing. How can we use that to make ourselves better people, more content individuals and happier societies? Okay, we can move on to this one until now. One more thing, actually, I want to mention about this. He went into a little bit of detail about how when we develop systems, sometimes we forget the human element. We might do, we might be very efficient. We might have things done in a certain way, but they're disconnected from human humans, right? Um, and, and as a consequence, they become really great machines and systems and so on. 
but they're probably more suited for robots than they are for human beings. So how did we customize our programs in the community, our interaction with our friends and family, the things that we do in our lives to make them more human friendly? And how can we take lessons from the absence or the consequence of the absence of these things in the lives of people to make sure that we don't fall into the same traps over and over again? So with that, here's a study that was done over a long period of time on happiness. What keeps us healthy and happy as we go through life? If you were going to invest now in your future best self, where would you put your time and your energy? There was a recent survey of millennials asking them what their most important life goals were. And over 80% said that a major life goal for them was to get rich. And another 50% of those same young adults said that another major life goal was to become famous. <laughs> and we're constantly told to lean in to work, to Notice the two things, rich and famous, as opposed to, if you remember death, what does that do to you? And how does distraction away from death lead us to make decisions or goals and have ambitions that are leading us away from happiness? Push harder and achieve more. We're given the impression that these are the things that we need to go after in order to have a good life. Pictures of entire lives, of the choices that people make and how those choices work out for them, those pictures are almost impossible to get. Most of what we know about human life, we know from asking people to remember the past. And as we know, hindsight is anything but 2020. We forget vast amounts of what happens to us in life. And sometimes memory is downright creative. But what if we could watch entire lives as they unfold through time? What if we could study people from the time that they were teenagers all the way into old age to see what really keeps people happy and healthy? We did that. The Harvard study of adult development may be the longest study of adult life that's ever been done. For 75 years, we've tracked the lives of 724 men. Year after year, asking about their work, their home lives, their health, and of course, asking all along the way without knowing how their life stories were going to turn out. Studies like this are exceedingly rare. Almost all projects of this kind fall apart within a decade because too many people drop out of the study or funding for the research dries up or the researchers get distracted or they die and nobody moves the ball further down the field. But through a combination of luck and the persistence of several generations of researchers, this study has survived. About 60 of our original 724 men are still alive, still participating in the study, most of them in their 90s. And we are now beginning to study the more than 2,000 children of these men. And I'm the fourth director of the study. Since 1938, we've tracked the lives of two groups of men. The first group started in the study when they were sophomores at Harvard College. They all finished college during World War II, and then most went off to serve in the war. And the second group that we followed was a group of boys from Boston's poorest neighborhoods. Boys who were chosen for the study specifically because they were from some of the most troubled and disadvantaged families in the Boston of the 1930s. Most lived in tenements, many without hot and cold running water. Tenements are like apartments. 
when they entered the study, all of these teenagers were interviewed, they were given medical exams, we went to their homes and we interviewed their parents. And then these teenagers grew up into adults who entered all walks of life. They became factory workers and lawyers and bricklayers and doctors. One president of the United States. Some developed alcoholism. A few developed schizophrenia. Some climbed the social ladder from the bottom all the way to the very top. And some made that journey in the opposite direction. The founders of this study would never in their wildest dreams have imagined that I would be standing here today, 75 years later, telling you that the study still continues. Every two years, our patient and dedicated research staff calls up our men and asks them if we can send them yet one more set of questions about their lives. Many of the inner city Boston men ask us, why do you keep wanting to study me? My life just isn't that interesting. The Harvard men never ask that question. <laughs> Get the clearest picture of these lives. We don't just send them questionnaires. We interview them in their living rooms. We get their medical records from their doctors. We draw their blood. We scan their brains. We talk to their children. We videotape them talking with their wives about their deepest concerns. And when about a decade ago, we finally asked the wives if they would join us as members of the study, many of the women said, you know, it's about time. <laughs> so what have we learned? What are the lessons that come from the tens of thousands of pages of information that we've generated on these lives. Well, the lessons aren't about wealth or fame or working harder and harder. The clearest message that we get from this 75 year study is this. Good relationships keep us happier and healthier, period. We've learned three big lessons about relationships. The first is that social connections are really good for us and that loneliness kills. It turns out that people who are more socially connected to family, to friends, to community are happier, they're physically healthier, and they live longer than people who are less well connected. And the experience of loneliness turns out to be toxic. People who are more isolated than they want to be from others find that they are less happy, their health declines earlier in midlife, their brain functioning declines sooner, and they live shorter lives than people who are not lonely. And the sad fact is that at any given time, more than one in five Americans will report that they're lonely. And we know that you can be lonely in a crowd and you can be lonely in a marriage. So the second big lesson that we learned is that it's not just the number of friends you have and it's not whether or not you're in a committed relationship, but it's the quality of your close relationships that matters. It turns out that living in the midst of conflict is really bad for our health. High conflict marriages, for example, without much affection turn out to be very bad for our health, perhaps worse than getting divorced. And living in the midst of good, warm relationships is protective. Once we had followed our men all the way into their 80s, we wanted to look back at them at midlife and to see if we could predict who was going to grow into a happy, healthy octogenarian and who wasn't. And when we gathered together everything we knew about them at age 50, it wasn't their middle-aged cholesterol levels that predicted how they were going to grow old. It was how satisfied they were in their relationships. The people who were the most satisfied in their relationships at age 50 were the healthiest at age 80. And good, close relationships seem to buffer us from some of the slings and arrows of getting old. Our most happily partnered men and women reported in their 80s that on the days when they had more physical pain, their moods stayed just as happy. 
but the people who were in unhappy relationships on the days when they reported more physical pain, it was magnified by more emotional pain. And the third big lesson that we learned about relationships and our health is that good relationships don't just protect our bodies, they protect our brains. It turns out that being in a securely attached relationship to another person in your 80s is protective, that the people who are in relationships where they really feel they can count on the other person in times of need, those people's memories stay sharper longer. And the people in relationships where they feel they really can't count on the other one, those are the people who experience earlier memory decline. And those good relationships, they don't have to be smooth all the time. Some of our octogenarian couples could bicker with each other day in and day out. But as long as they felt that they could really count on the other when the going got tough, those arguments didn't take a toll on their memories. So this message that good, close relationships are good for our health and well-being, this is wisdom that's as old as the hills. Why is this so hard to get and so easy to ignore? Well, we're human. What we'd really like is a quick fix, something we can get that'll make our lives good and keep them that way. Relationships are messy and they're complicated and the, the hard work of tending to family and friends, it's not sexy or glamorous. It's also lifelong. It never ends. The people in our 75-year study who were the happiest in retirement were the people who had actively worked to replace workmates with new playmates. Just like the millennials in that recent survey, many of our men, when they were starting out as young adults, really believed that fame and wealth and high achievement were what they needed to go after to have a good life. But over and over, over these 75 years, our study has shown that the people who fared the best were the people who leaned into relationships with family, with friends, with community. So what about you? Let's say you're 25 or you're 40 or you're 60. What might leaning into relationships even look like? Well, the possibilities are practically endless. It might be something as simple as replacing screen time with people time or livening up a stale relationship by doing something new together, long walks or date nights, or reaching out to that family member who you haven't spoken to in years because those all too common family feuds take a terrible toll on the people who hold the grudges. I'd like to close with a quote from Mark Twain. More than a century ago, he was looking back on his life and he wrote this. There isn't time, so brief is life, for bickerings, apologies, heart burnings, callings to account. There is only time for loving and but an instant, so to speak, for that. The good life is built with good relationships. Thank you. <laughs>
it just doesn't happen when with a good relationship with someone. Okay, how would you help this person? Um, I mean, given, I guess, the context of that video, she should examine her relationships with the people around her and, like, take a closer look at what's going on and seeing, like, why she feels this way. Okay. How would you, how about this person? What is she missing? What does she need? What What is going on over here? And how does your, how would your strategy account for this? Um, I think the main thing she's missing is purpose. And um, with purpose, I think happiness would like resolve that or it would resolve the happiness issue um but i mean i guess the first thing i would do is ask more questions about um like what's going on in her life and um like who exactly does she feel like she's a burden on um uh, yeah I need more information, I guess, to see exactly what I would tell her. It seems like she has issues with comparing other people to herself. Because um, she's looking at other people's happiness and stuff. Um, yeah. Okay. I'd be interested to know if, um, like, well, her age and what is her living situation? You know, is it that she's young and she would like to be married and she feels like a burden on her parents and her family because she's not working or, um, or is it, or is she married and she's in a bad relationship that makes her feel like she's a burden? Or is she someone who's been married, had children, and children are grown up, and now she feel, and now she doesn't have a purpose. Like she doesn't have, maybe she hasn't worked before, or um, her purpose was always getting up and taking care of the family, and now that that's no longer there, um, I would like to have more information. It could be that she has certain life expectations that are not realistic. I'm not sure. Okay. In all of these situations, there's something very common. So what can you do that, that addresses all of these situations? And this is not saying like the, the entire you know, your course of actions, but just, just one thing that you could do to address something that's very common in all of them. That all of these people want to just, I guess, hear from another person. I think they all need someone they could um, uh, talk to and vent and feel like the person they're talking to understands them kind of. Um, and like validates their issues that they're feeling. Okay, so some sort of validation. Okay, what can you say to this person? Um, I mean, it depends. A statement, just one statement. Uh, one statement one st might be sort of like relevant in all of these cases, all of these potential possible cases that could be you know, understood from this uh, presentation. Yeah, um, you could say something like, that must be hard to deal with. Um, 
because some people they don't like it when you say yeah I, I get what you mean or I understand it because uh, they don't think you actually know what they're going through so if you like acknowledge that what they're going through must be difficult then that I think covers everyone One of the things that I found useful is to let the person know that they're not a burden on me. That I will be with them as much as I can be with Linda uh, as we proceed. So once I've worked out working with somebody, these are the things that I mentioned to them. That they have purpose, that they're important, even if they're just important to me because I'm working with them and I'm giving them my time. And that they are not a burden on me. And I will be with them as much as I can in terms of supporting their process overall. And then they can reach me anytime. And I will account for my time, as in if I'm burdened or if, if I'm busy with something, I'm not going to be able to pick up the call or respond to the text messages. But if I'm talking to that person, if I'm calling, if I'm you know, interacting with them, then that's me showing that this is not a burden on me, that I'm like, I've already accounted for my time. And that this time that I'm willing to allocate to them, that it's for them. And that I'm not burdened by that. And if I don't have that time, or if I'm not able to give time, then I'm going to account for that myself by not being not be able to respond or whatever. And so they shouldn't feel that they're a burden on me. So this is one of the things that I do. Because <clears throat> in the beginning, a lot of people will say, for example, like, you know, I'm taking so much of your time and stuff. And I'll say, if I need to leave, if I have something else, I will let you know. But if I'm here, if I'm talking to you, if I'm connecting, whatever, then in this case, that this is your time, I'm allocating my time for you specifically, and that's it. So I've already accounted for what could be a burden on me. <coughs> and uh, following up on that, following up on that word that you give them. So if that person reaches out to you and you have time, and you feel like you can give that time, and you give it to them, and in this conversation you actually show they actually mean a lot to you, uh, then they feel more relaxed they feel like uh, you can connect with like that they actually have somebody that is rooting for them that is saying that hey everything will be okay we'll get through this together be it enough that's it as simple as this to start off some people really need to hear that just just because they feel like they're alone how are they going to do this you know, what's going to happen and stuff how can they do this alone uh, and this is the difference between you know, practical empathy and, and practical sympathy. Sympathy would be like, okay, I feel bad. I'm sorry you're going through this, and that's that, right? But kind of getting in the trench with them and saying, here, we'll do this together. You're not alone in this. And that just changes things a lot. And that's it. Now, whether this person ends up doing the things that you might feel that they should be doing or whatever they, they wanted to do or that was good for them, whatever, that's not the, the issue. The issue is just them feeling like, they're part of you know something that they're working with somebody they're not alone in this that okay you know they'll be able to get to this inshallah i've had people you know just just needing to hear that it'll be okay that's it that's all they needed to hear like they, they reached out to me they mentioned various things and all they needed to hear was it'll be okay or something like I, you know, I appreciate you sharing this, and I'm going to be with you as much as I can, Inshallah. And you're not alone. Just, just knowing that somebody cares, that was sufficient for them. You know, so these are some things that I've personally done. Um, these might be useful strategies for certain people, but of course, you have to when you actually make that commitment. When you say these things, you have to really mean them, and you have to follow up on them. Your word is going to be very, very important to Binyan. And being realistic in your own expectations in your own uh, like in your own time and so on so if i cannot sustain something i will let the people know ahead of time hey you know whenever i have time that's for, like and i can give that to you then it'll be for you and i will let you know if i need to leave if i need to stop the conversation if i uh, you know i'll give you a heads up and that'll be me accounting for my time because i want to make sure that i can help you sustainably as long as possible you know? so I, I will account for that so just you know that's it and then that's it. And the person, when the person 
connects with you, they know that if they maybe you missed their call, it's probably because you were busy or something like that, but it's not because you were ignoring them. Whereas another person on the other hand, if they haven't made that clarification, I did have a person who mentioned to me that they were reaching out to somebody else and the other person didn't respond, so they actually felt like the other person was ignoring them. But for me, because I made that clarification earlier on, they knew that it wasn't that I was ignoring them, it was just that maybe I was busy with other things that I was involved with or some other things and I couldn't at that moment you know, focus on them. And so they were okay with that, they would just leave me messages and then whenever I got a chance I would connect back with them and that was that. So something, something like that um, I found very useful in just most of these cases that I get. So this is what I was talking about, the commonality issue. Um, and that's it. As you get deeper, as you explore more, uh, you'll be able to find out that there are differences in some of these things. However, some fundamental things are similar. So if they're feeling alone, I've had a situation where somebody reached out to me. They were having some struggle with their marriage. Um, but they didn't want their husband to find out that they were that they were speaking with me so they were just talking to me and they were just they needed somebody to hear kind of get an idea of like what what like just just kind of like you know share idea uh just talk about what's happening and stuff just to kind of like unload but they also didn't want their husband to find out because things might get really complicated if he did so i had to keep that conversation those conversations private and at the same time, I had to understand here that the person is simply just trying to like unload, vent, uh, not not to break things, but try to figure out how to first of all unload all the stuff that might, that might be hurting inside, and then after that, finding or or through this process, find a way to actually make things work out with their family and husband and so on. So it happens. Um, in this case, then my role was simply just to support the process as opposed to you know like trying to intervene in a way of like, you know, um, taking the lead on this and saying, okay, I'm going to do this, I'll do this and stuff, right? So it was more like, okay, what would you like to do? Okay, do you want to talk about this? Okay, if you want me to give you, you know, like some advice or like, you know, like, you know, Islamic advice or whatever, then, you know, I'll, I'll wait for, for you to ask me that. I'm not going to just give it up front because sometimes people just want, don't want to get, be given advice. They want to be understood and just to be like, just to vent and that's it. Sometimes they'll be like, okay, well, that felt a lot better. Now I can get back into this uh, trench and kind of deal with things as they come. And then sometimes they'll have to come back and say, like, okay, it's another time I need to unload. It's getting overwhelming. I just need to talk about it. So they talk and then they can get back. So sometimes it's like that. So a lot of these cases, just an idea of feeling that they're not alone, that somebody cares. And that puts things in perspective then. That makes it a lot easier for them to continue. When you have somebody rooting for you, somebody uh, like cheering you on, it's a lot easier than you kind of having to go alone, even if it's one person, but a person who really cares, not, not doing a fake, but they actually show that they care, even if they're not consistent and like they're not able to be like there every single day, but they're there in spirit just because every time you speak with them, every time you like interact with them, uh, you feel that they are actually really there present with you when they're having that conversation with you. And they really care about it. So that just changes the dynamics a lot. But this has been my experience and a lot of so I just, just some thoughts that I, I wanted to share on this. And it, it is it is becoming extremely common nowadays. Uh, these kinds of cases are becoming extremely common nowadays. And sometimes people might go to a therapist or somebody uh, just because they need that somebody to talk to. And they feel like at least the therapist will listen and stuff, right? So sometimes the function of a therapist or a mental health professional changes in practice because of how the client or how the patient sort of steers the direction of the conversation or what the needs are of the patient, as opposed to what the mental health professional or therapist might have done otherwise to guide this person. Other thoughts from people? This is similar to what the, the first video that we watched, that's what he was sort of getting at. How to design systems that are human-centered or patient-centered as opposed to, you know, disease-centered or whatever. 
So focus on the people that you're working with more than you focus on things in the sense that like the human beings are there. And if you look at like how st- like the, the studies that show uh, people when they feel supported, they, when they feel they have a community, when they just feel like they have purpose and they're happy, their health improves. And overall, they become better. If you remember the, the, the other study that we looked at, that the lady was talking about the Sundays, eating the, the same Sunday, but one other people, they thought that this is really high in calories and so on. And the other one, they you know, it was like, it's not really high in calories, it's like a really healthy equivalent, but they were both the same. But how the body actually, you know, framed it or the brain, the way it framed it, the body actually responded according to how the brain looked at it, even though they were the exact same things, right? So how your brain has an impact on your body functioning and your health and so on. That's something that's important as well. So maybe providing that community experience, helping people feel connected, might be the thing that actually gets people healthier and happier overall because of the implications of those things. So other people, any thoughts? Yeah, I think um, what you mentioned about letting her feel like um, she's not a burden has to be done so carefully. I know you mentioned that, but just like when you say I'm going to be there, you know, that it has to be very like with realistic limits on it. Um, just because somebody in that state of mind may be super needy. So if they understand that, yes, I am available for you and I'm gonna help you get, help get you through this, but there are times when I won't be reached. And so I think that's really good. And it would have, I think a similar effect of, you know, feeling like giving a feeling of hope similar to when I walk outside for the first time after five days and see sunshine. You know, it's that feeling of like, oh, there is something good out here. So. Yeah. Sometimes that just causes the, uh, a, a shift. Of course, I think following up on that, you know, you'd, you'd have to address the, you know, the sources of this feeling of being a burden and um, questioning worth. Just delve into that and figure out what's going on. I think there's a um, like the, there's like a general uh, cause, and that's a disconnection in communities and sort of like the isolated lives that people are living or end up living, um, and then they only get to have that connection in the message. Like for example, for weekend programs or Friday nights and stuff, and even then, it's sort of like not really uh, in a certain way. So, what if our communities provided just opportunities for people to just come together to come together? You know. Just, just so they feel like they're part of something. Um, we had, like, back in the day, we, there were, used to be IAR picnics, like, every year. Um, and they were, there used to be a huge, huge thing. And then they, had, they used to have youth days. I think the last one was 2008. So every year they used to have a youth day, and like, everyone would come together and stuff. It was fun. Um, but how can we increase the frequency of events like this, where it's just so people can come together to feel like they're connected, and they, they come together... They they're happy. Everyone feels like they look forward to these opportunities to just hang out. Um, for example, the, if you go and carry, um, oftentimes it used to be at least until you know COVID nineteen that like on on Saturdays like people would come like to downtown carry and they would have like a farmers market and they have like other you know things here and there and stuff. So if we can have things where people look forward to coming. 
the, throughout the week they also feel like everyone's sort of together everyone's kind of looking out for each other like somebody could just like come to somebody's house say like hey i want to like i want to come visit you and stuff yeah yeah come come by and stuff you know like the kind of stuff that used to be in the past um if, if, if you talk to people that are our elders uh, when they were young and they were in their you know when they were overseas you'll see that they talk about how they had an actual community experience like everyone was sort of you know, as a big giant family you weren't really blood family but you were just like a neighborhood family and stuff or you're just like family friends and stuff but they're all like family and stuff so people would like go to each other um, a lot of the things were more informal as in like they everyone cared for each other all the parents would care for the kids all the kids would like kind of look at the parents all the parents as like, parents and stuff and all that so that kind of large family environment i think really had a lot to do uh, with sort of curbing some of the things that people are feeling today and i think when when we start doing that when we start bringing people together uh, letting them feel that each of the, each person has some sort of contribution to the you know be to the to the, the people around them has that each person has some meaning in the lives of everyone else around them then that makes them feel that like they can belong they're part of something they have a purpose they have a meaning a sense of belonging and things like that i agree um uh, there's there's i would like to say i grew up in a neighborhood like that in south chicago area <laughs> it was really good um but I think that there's a fair number of people who don't feel comfortable in a unstructured social situation. But when you have something like, um, like we're doing the gardening, you know, you have people show up for that and they actually wouldn't come to a social event, but if it's something that is, they can bring a friend or two friends and they can do some work side by side and you know it gives them sort of a purpose for being there um you get a different i guess it provides a reason for a certain type of person to come that's what i'm trying to say <laughs> not everybody's just comfortable going for a social gathering so th i have a follow-up question but this is more of like a research question that we can look into a little bit more are those people who are like who need structured activities, social activities all the time, actually happier at the end. Is there a correlation between like more structure in their lives to more happiness and contentment? Or is that potentially a, like an obstacle and it's just become systematic like robotic and it's not actually keeping them healthy? But they're thinking that it is keeping them healthy. This is a question that um, I, I think we can explore and research a little bit more. But some things to you know, just look into. I don't know if there is data that you've you've come across in this. I know there are people that tend to want certain things, um, but I'm also a person who advocates for the bigger picture of things. So even a person would like for something to happen. Sometimes if it's harming them or it's not really helping them in a way that they're thinking, then I think that. You know, overall, the community should have uh, should not necessarily take that into account in the sense that, like, customizing programs for those things, um, because if it's not actually helping the person, or if it's harming the person, then just because the person wants it doesn't mean that we should give them that. Right. On the other hand, if it is something that's actually you know shown that this is going to be beneficial or this is going to help a person feel more content and stuff like that, then yeah, of course, those are those are good things. And and overall, Islam gives us you know these kinds of uh, things that people can do to feel good and Allah Sahadara knows the psyche of the people and stuff what they need what mm -hmm. their needs are and so on so the prescriptions are according to that understanding that deep understanding the depth of it all yeah um I'm I actually don't know anybody who needs that at all times but I do know a lot of people need that sort of structured interaction for the first few times so if it's a new situation, um, like if somebody had never been to, let's say the Raleigh Masjid before, and they didn't know anybody there, they might be more willing to show up for something where they have an assigned task, which 
causes interaction with people than if it was just a free social environment. Okay, so just kind of like an introduction, like a formal introduction to get into the community experience. Right, and and to have it so it's not awkward because, you know, if you're assigned to clean out a closet or if you're assigned to plant this flower bed, you know, you have that you know, okay, we're, we, we're working together on this and there's that structure involved, but it doesn't mean that, you know, they would forever be that way, but it gives them that security of introduction into a new situation. Yeah. What about like picnics? If, if there's like a, you know, community picnic. Again, if you don't know anybody there, uh, you know, that's, that can be a very difficult situation for people. But if somebody has been, you know, grew up in the community, then that's a different story. Okay, so pretty much people's background that might have, might impact how they feel comfortable or in which environments they feel more comfortable or mm -hmm. if they are the kind of people that end up becoming the way, like uh, if they have become the kind of people who can get into a, a new environment and still be able to interact with people versus if they get into an environment and they have not yet learned a uh, certain, you know, skill set or, or whatever to get in, you know, just to get to interact with new people, meet new people and connect with them. Mm -hmm. Or maybe they had bad experiences which made them have cold feet when it comes to interacting with new people and being in new places and so on. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. I noticed that um, a lot of times when families were new to the community, you know, they would approach me saying, is there a volunteer project we can get involved in? And that was, you know, like a very um, common way for people to want to get to know the community or get involved to find a place was to, to find a project that they can work on and meet people. So how can we make it so that we have the community become such that when new people come in that there is some sort of like liaising between the masjid or the organization and the new people like how can we do it so that there is like an office or there is like a committee or a group of people that are sort of the greeters right as, as these are the people that like anytime you come to the masjid yeah, on the on the website there's like a page for or like a like a like an area where it talks about if you're new to the community reach out to our welcoming community, uh, committee or something like that, right? right. Uh, how can we set up something like that so that people have that avenue to get sort of like a, a direct connection with the community and, and like not have to go through that awkward phase, for example? Um, so at ICM, for the sister's side, we had the women's committee um, did monthly tea for sisters. And it was specifically for, you know, there might be a small talk or something, but it was then just, so it gave it that small amount of structure you might need to get in and meet people. And then there was the social of tea and, and desserts afterwards. But um, we, my vision was to have a, a dedicated group of sisters who um, they may even do the baskets, you know, that would, give information about the area, phone numbers for um, people in the community who might be good contacts, you know, go. Um, and a lot of people would reach out through our Facebook page, direct message asking about the community, about apartments, about, you know, where's a good place to live nearby the masjid. So I think that it's sort of very, it's sort of informal, but I think if you can expand that and make it more dedicated and more well-known, it would be better. Um, and then something for the brothers as well, because, you know, they may not be, um, they're going out to work and they may find that as their, the place where they're meeting people. But I know that they also um, have a, the same struggle as anybody else. Yeah, and also non-Muslim or new Muslims, the reverts, when they come in, they have a similar, you know, the, the, the initial experience, 
even if it's in a different way, but it's still the same sort of initial uh, barrier to entry, essentially. Yes. Yes. People are very happy when somebody takes Shahada. There's a lot of hugs and tears and um, passing of phone numbers. And then, but there's no official committee, no official group of people who will actually call that person the next couple days or the next week or, you know, and sort of take them under their wing and, and bring them to the masjid and accompany them to different events and answer their weird questions and so to be to be formalized and dedicated would be awesome. yeah and, and likewise for youth when they're first getting used to islam or just muslims in general when they're getting back into wanting to learn about deen and trying to practice it and so on having that person to kind of liaise between them and the masjid for example that would that could be really useful i know i know there was one person that we were in touch with um, and he was really into dean and like he was really, like you know he had a nice group of youth friends and so on um, but then life events uh, happened and he ended up you know working in a place where he got into things that were not really good um, he committed you know various like big sins and stuff and so on like major sins and stuff and so then he started feeling like how in the world am i going to come to the masjid now Right. Uh, first of all, concern about how Allah Subhanahu wa Taala would know his interaction with Allah Subhanahu wa Taala because is Allah Subhanahu wa Taala going to forgive him or so on? That the doubt that Shaitan typically puts in people, you know, in people's minds in these contexts. And I'm not saying it typically because it's very common, but everyone thinks that they're unique. Um, and then on the other hand, also because that person might feel like, what are other people going to say? You know, like if if I've committed all these sins and stuff, how are they going to look at me? Now, of course, the reality is, that, you know, most people probably don't know if you've committed those sins or not. Um, but also, Allah Subhanahu wa Taala does forgive you if you just have. You just all you have to do is take the steps forward towards Him and go from there. You know, the follow the steps of Toba, repentance, and that's it. And uh, I, I think that's also another thing here where people are coming back or getting reattached to the. They need that sort of middle person to kind of connect, make that connection. So. Uh, there's so many so many examples of these things whether it's an msa's whether somebody is like in school doing something but then they want to connect to the message or they want to connect to the msa they want to connect to the muslim body in a certain place all of those things might require some sort of middle person so how can we have this greeting party this welcoming party or this this group of people that are sort of like the uh, like the greeters right that, that welcome the people in and be the bridge between the outside and the inside. Uh, the outside meaning like the non-Muslim stuff or whatever, or, or like just in general, the disconnection to the inside, which is more connected community, um, whether it's a neighborhood, whether it's like, you know, Muslims, whether it's whatever. So I, I think these are some things that would add to the element of humanity or the, you know, the, add to the, uh, the element of humanity uh, into our interactions and our relationships and probably address many of these issues that people are feeling nowadays of loneliness, uh, not having contentment, not feeling like they belong, feeling like they're a burden on other people and, and so on. Um, I was just thinking about this company that I interviewed with once and they're uh, telling me about their program for new hires where like they assign you someone um, who's like your go-to person like they'll show you the ropes and stuff and they'll pretty much take you under their wing. And um, uh, I feel like that's like something similar like that could be done on the masjid level. Cause really it, like it's those deep connections that actually um, get you somewhere. It's not just like you volunteer with a bunch of random people and you have small talk. Like usually those connections don't do mu too much for you, but if you have like one deep connection, um, uh, you could usually get new ones from that. Cause like when I think about it, most of my friends and most people I know, it started off with like a really good friend and then it branched out from like maybe one of their friends or something. But like maybe there could be people who like volunteer themselves. And like they say, if there's like new, new people to the community like I'll be, I'd like to be this person's um, 
uh, go-to friend or whatever. And, you know, they could, you could assign them um, uh, someone like that has a similar background, maybe similar culture or similar uh, uh, field of work or something. But yeah, I, I think the, the main idea is to focus on um, deep connections rather than um, just those, like, I don't want to call them shallow or anything, but the ones that don't really, they tend not to last too much if it's just like an exchange of basic information, you know? Yeah, yeah. And, and many, many um, uh, contexts have this. For example, there was a school that I was attending in Durham and they had this thing where you would be paired with an older, like there was, the school was for two, like two grade levels. So you would come in, you would be assigned uh, like, what they would call like a sibling um, from your, from like the next level up. So 11th and 12th grade, right? So if you're coming in as a junior, then a senior would be assigned to you um, to you know, kind of get you, like, like kind of teach you the ropes essentially, right? And then when you would become a senior, you would be assigned an incoming junior to kind of like teach them the ropes and stuff. And then, you know, go from there. Uh, likewise, in, in different, you know, communities, different contexts, you're going to have this middle person that just kind of gets you in, kind of gives you an introduction. Uh, this is usually what you might see, like, in terms of orientation when you're entering into colleges, for example, just getting the initial sort of interaction with the community, with the, with the university. You might have tours and stuff like that. You might have a person that's a go-to person. You might have, you know, when you get to, res you know, when you live on campus, for example, you might have a residential advisor, uh, the person that's on your hallway, that's kind of like that, that sort of is a liaison between policymakers or some, some, you know, higher management and the rest of the, you know, the group that's living on in the suite or in that area, for example. And uh, like the answer in the, in the, like the comment in the chat, uh, like the Ansar, that's exactly what the Prophet said, that, you know, the Ansar were paired, the Muhajirun were paired with the Ansar um, as they were coming in. And the Ansar were the ones that were kind of like, you know, helping them settle down and stuff, kind of connecting with them. And he actually, could, you know, they can, they were considered as brothers, essentially, right? Um, they even thought that they're going to be inheriting from each other, potentially, like the neighbors and stuff were also uh, given so much importance that the other people thought that they were going to be inheriting from each other and so on. But the idea is just that having that sort of transition um, in, in, in the context of, you know, like in this, in this like, professional setting they, they call this or in educational settings for example they call this a culture shock when you're coming in from a particular culture to a new culture you can have a culture shock now that could be a culture of you know workplace or it could be an actual culture in a society and you're coming into a different society so this would be a culture shock and so they would have somebody kind of like helping you transition from that to the new one um, kind of just kind of connecting the dots kind of helping you kind of get into this new place kind of showing you around and things like that so this is sort of um, some, see there are some things that we see in so many different places but um, perhaps we could do a little bit more of that in our community uh, in our communities as well just just for in general maybe we can have like you know uh, like for example uh, um, the various masajid have the list of members but how many of those members are actually active in the community and how do we connect with them and call them and just say hey we're just checking in uh, this is the greeting or this is like sort of like the liaison or whatever party you want to call it, whatever committee you want to say. And then they communicate with all the members individually and say, we're just checking in if you ever need anything and stuff. This is just information. you, you know, And anytime you want to talk, contact us, you can email this number or call this number and we will help you in terms of the, the things that are available at the masjid, in terms of like anything that you might have questions about and so on. So if we did that, imagine, I, I know this is going to take some uh, coordination, um, but we can even hire people to do that. And there are people who would love to do these kinds of things. So, um, yeah, and even if they're sort of like, uh, they're rotational, as in like, not, not even rotational, but like sort of like short-term commitments, like one person can volunteer to do five calls and that's it for, for one time and that's it. Like that you give them a week and say, make these five calls in a week, there's five people and that's it. And you never have to do this again. That's it. Like, so it's a very short-term commitment and you don't have to like have long-term commitments from them. So that you might, they might fall off or whatever, um, but it's just a short thing, short task, easy to do, and that's it. And then uh, you don't have to worry about like retaining them or having like a dedicated group. You could just have the job done. Um, there could be like one or two people that are actually like you know, kind of sort of like in the back end, but other people are just simply volunteers that are doing short-term commitments. Just like when you get volunteers for a particular event, it's only for a few hours and that's it. 
that's more sustainable uh, you know, on a volunteer basis um, than you know, long-term commitments and stuff where people get burnt out and so on. So allocating or like um, outsourcing things that might be outsourcing to volunteers, uh, things that might be you know, doable by volunteers. But doing them in like short, short bits or chunks. Okay, so um, I am looking at the time, and we had a lengthy discussion. I'm that over here, so we'll go ahead and close in Chala. If you have more comments or thoughts, you can reach out via email, um, or you can reach out, you know, any other communication methods that you know of to connect with us, um, or we can continue this conversation next time if you have any thoughts uh, next time in Chala. So with that. Um, I'd like to go ahead and close. And Subhanakallahum bihamdik. Nashadu an la ilaha illa anta nistaghfiruka wa natubu ilayk. Jazakumullah khairan. And assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.